Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Wednesday night sunlight service. This is the Kingdom of Love, part six. And I really kind of think that I just have a really simple, uh, hopefully encouraging message tonight. But I want to kind of start looking a little bit uh, uh, at some of the parables that Jesus used when he was describing the kingdom. Because I really think it's important that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about the kingdom. And uh, for the last month or so, I was really trying to hit the, the point, the idea, the truth that the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of love, right, because God is love, is not of this world. It's a totally different, totally radical, totally uh, uh, more excellent way of living. It's, an, it's not just life, it's abundant life. That's what Jesus came, that we might have life and have it more abundantly. He came to give us something better. He came to show us who God really is so we could experience that father-son relationship with God the way that God always intended for us to experience it. So, uh, so again, for tonight I want to look at, uh, my first passage is in Matthew chapter 13, and he gives two really short kind of uh, examples or parables about what the kingdom is, or, or uh, really trying to explain it. And I really think it's interesting when you look at Jesus' parables, he was trying to explain something so different and so radical, but he was putting it in terms that are uh, uh, really that are very down to earth, that are really kind of easy to understand, especially for the people that he was talking to at that time, people who were farmers, people who were simple people, uh, people of the earth you know, salt of the earth type of people, as it were. He wasn't talking to theologians. He wasn't talking to people who necessarily considered themselves really spiritual. So he even told the disciples, he said, I can speak to you plainly, but to the rest of these guys, I have to speak in parables because they don't have the ears to hear and the eyes to see that you have. So he was really trying to make things simple, and somehow I think we've, we've uh, lost that simplicity that is Christ, and we make it so hard sometimes to, to experience these things because we make it like, well, I, I'm not good enough. Or, or we make it like, well, okay, that's good for someday, but it's not for today. When, when we know that the kingdom is now, because we know that the kingdom is within us. So when, we, uh, when we're looking at this for today, here's my thought for today. I'm going to give you my thought, and then I'm going to kind of really try to back it up with a little bit of scripture. And like I said, I think it's going to be brief tonight. I think it's going to be simple tonight. I hope, at least. I usually feel like I just wander around trying to make my point, and hopefully I get there. But uh, tonight what I want to say is, a little bit of love goes a long way. It feeds on itself, and it grows, and it grows into a raging Holy Ghost wildfire. All it needs is a spark. All it needs is for you to be you. Not for you to try to be somebody else. Not for you to try to be uh, a world changer or a history maker. Okay, that's not what we were called to do. The only thing we were called to do is to be a son. And as we're going to see, that's really, that's the most important thing you can do. It's just to be the son, to receive everything the Father hands down, to receive that inheritance, as it were, and, and, and then to just release it. To just let him fill you to overflowing so that it comes out of you naturally. And, and again, that's what we're going to look at tonight. But here's, here's again, here's, here it is. What we are expected to do is to love one another as we are loved by Jesus. To do what we can do where we're at with what we have. And I know especially, especially for somebody like me, that can be really, really hard because I never feel like I'm doing enough. I never feel like I'm loving enough. I never feel like uh, I'm, I'm serving enough, as it were. And I, I always feel like I should be doing more. I should be doing more. I should be doing more. And a lot of times it's really hard for me to just be still and know that He is God. To just be still and know that He placed me here. He put me where I'm at. He put me in contact with the people that I'm in contact with. And, and my only real responsibility is just to connect with those people that He put me into contact with. To just love those people that are around me. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. And before we get into Matthew, I want to read Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10 in the New Living Translation. And it reads like this. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices 
to see the work begin. This again, this is a very personal one to me because you know, even though I, even though in, in, in to some degree, I've kind of planted my flag, I've kind of accomplished some things, I've published some books, and and you know, I have the blog that gets a, a kind of a decent response in my videos, like like I'm doing something. But again, to me, it always it always feels small, and that's why we should not despise these small beginnings, because uh, again, as we're going to see in just a second. Small things lead to bigger things when they grow, okay? So, uh, like I said, a little bit of love goes a long way because it feeds on itself and it grows. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 31. In the King James it reads like this. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. I want to stop here for a second because uh, I heard an awesome message about the importance of the mustard seed, and uh, and basically it boiled down to this: a lot of seeds can cross pollinate and they can you know they they can grow that way, but a mustard seed will not met, mix or mesh with anything else. A mustard seed is pure. If you plant a mustard seed, you're going to get that kind of tree. You're not going to get any kind of hybrid. You're not going to get any kind of mixture of law and grace, if I can say it that way. A mustard seed is one of the smallest seeds, and it grows into one of the biggest trees because it's pure. And that's what it says in verse 32. It says, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And I thought this was interesting too. This is Jesus speaking, right? Where did the, the bird or, or, or the dove remember uh, Noah when he landed on Mount Ararat? Which means the curse is reversed. He let out a dove and the dove flew away. And we have no record of it landing until we get to Jesus being baptized. And then the bird landed, the Holy Spirit landed, the dove landed on him. So what are we talking about when we're talking about the kingdom? What are we talking about when we're talking about the seed? Remember Jesus said, a corn of wheat abides alone unless it dies, and if it dies, it brings forth a great harvest. So who's the seed? He is. The incorruptible seed. That goes all the way back to talking about Abraham. Because remember, God promised Abraham a son, but then Abraham, he tried to make that son happen his own way when, when it looked like the promise of God wasn't coming in, in, in Abraham's timing. And then God said, I'm going to bless that son that you made, but I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna bless even more the son that I promised you, the seed, the incorruptible seed that was promised. So again, the seed that we're talking about, of course, is Jesus. And remember, Jesus said that the last will be first and the first will be last. So the smallest seed, that doesn't mean it's the least significant seed. And that's again why we're not despising small beginnings. Everybody and everything has to start somewhere. And if you're waiting until you're ready, I don't know if I, I don't know if ready exists, you know, really. Like like even 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 when when uh, when Logan started to uh, come into the picture, people always asked me, "Were you guys were you guys trying to have a baby? Were you guys ready to have a baby?" And I was like, "Well, we we weren't really trying not to, but but it's not like we we had a plan. It's not like we were quote unquote ready. You know, you just you just go, you just go with the flow, you just." You know, you have to start somewhere. And if you're always waiting until you're ready, you might miss, you might miss the start. Or if you think, you know, it's too small, you might give up on it because what's the point? Well, the point is, when you plant a seed, the seed grows. The point is, it's the least of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's the greatest. So again, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Remember, it's not always about being the biggest and the best. Sometimes it's about just being you. Sometimes it's about just doing what you can do where you're at with what you've got. And then again, what we saw was the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. If he's the vine, and we know that he is, and we're the branches, the birds, or again in this case, the dove, the Holy Spirit, what does it land on? On us. Okay, so he's the seed, but, but what grew from that seed? We did. So that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of love is like Jesus being planted and us growing out of Him. 
right? He was the smallest of the seeds. Nobody, all the religious folk at least, they looked down on him. They literally, they spat on him and they beat him and they turned their backs on him and they rejected him. And then even when the people, the regular common folk, they had a chance. You know, uh, what's his name? Pilate, he said, do you want Barabbas to be released or do you want Jesus to be released? And, and they called for Barabbas because that's who they connected with. Barabbas was one of them, and Jesus was like an outsider. Jesus was somebody else. Jesus was coming and preaching this radical stuff that didn't make sense to anybody. Even his own disciples, who Jesus said, I can tell you guys this stuff because you can get it, you can handle it. They never got it. They could never handle it. When Jesus said, you know, uh, I'm going and, and you need to come with me, I think it was Thomas who said, how can we go with you when we don't know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They didn't know what he was talking about. They never knew. Again, because that, that, that bird... That Holy Spirit, it hadn't landed yet. I mean, it had landed on him, but it hadn't landed on us yet. So that's why it's so important that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches. Not just landing on them, but lodging, or, or again, dwelling. Because you see it all throughout the Old, Old Testament. The Holy Spirit would come on somebody in power. It would empower them to do something. But it didn't dwell in them until Jesus came. You know, again, literally the embodiment of the Holy Spirit, God in the flesh, living not just among us, but then after the cross, living within us. And that's when everything changed. That's when the Holy Spirit began to live within us. That's when, when God poured His Spirit out on all flesh on the cross, when His Son made the sacrifice that was necessary so that God could judge Him and, and again, judge us in Him, judge us righteously, and bring us back to life, and not just any life, but Jesus' everlasting, eternal, abundant resurrection life, that's when everything shifted, that's when everything changed. And not because the cross made us into something that God could love, because He always has loved us, and He always will love us. What else could the God who is love do? But that's not what the cross did. The, what the cross did was the cross changed us into somebody who could receive His love. So no longer was God's love too good to be true, but instead God's love was inside of us, and it was so good that we couldn't keep it to ourselves. It was so good it had to be true, and, and it was so good we had to share it. And again, that's, that's what the branches, to me, has always signified. Because if the tree is up and down, the branches go out. The branches reach out to those around them. And again, that's my point for today. That's, that's, that's what the kingdom is. The kingdom is just you touching the people that you can touch. It's not you running around like, like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to do more than you're capable of doing and burning yourself out. It's not you operating outside of your gifting or your calling. And again, I'm not talking about stretching because I believe God will stretch you. I believe God will ask you to do things that you don't think you're capable of. Like remember when he asked Moses to go speak to Pharaoh and Moses was like, I can't do that. I'm a stutterer. I'm not good at speaking. You got the wrong guy. And even though God knew he had the right guy, he still gave Moses and Aaron. He still provided Moses everything Moses needed to go do what he was called to do. You know, that, you know uh, I think it's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. We always talk about how God created grass before he created cows because he knew cows would be hungry. He always gives us what we need before he asks us to use what he's given us. And, and, and again, sometimes that stretches us. Sometimes we think we're not capable of things until we try. I think the word impossible only exists until you do that thing. But again, I think sometimes you have to start small. I don't believe in leaps of faith. I believe in walking by faith. And sometimes you have to walk in baby steps. And sometimes you have to crawl before you can learn to walk. And it's this maturation process. Not where we're becoming more of something, but where we're learning what we are. If we're already complete in Him, we can't grow more complete. How could you be more perfect than having the perfect one live inside of you? You can't. But when you start to understand how perfect he is, when you mark the perfect man, because the end of that man is peace, then you stop trying to be perfect, and then you just start living out of that perfection, out of that perfect love that casts out fear. And again, I, you know, I think, I think that's what we're talking about. Don't be afraid to start something where you're at. Don't be afraid to give that little spark. There's a light that's already shining in you. And if you start using that light, if you start touching other people with that light, you might just light them up too. And then in verse 33, which is really the one I wanted, Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, reads like this. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took 
and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. It only takes a little bit to affect everything. Like I started a new rant series today on Jesus Rant and I called it the butterfly because I was really kind of talking about the butterfly effect. You know, if a butterfly flaps its wings in America, it can start a hurricane in China because it, it, it moved something, it affected something. And whether we believe it or not, everything we do affects everything around us. Okay, if you weren't you, everything would be different. And, and by you trying to be somebody who's not, you're affecting things probably really in a negative way. Because people need you. The people that are, in your, that are in your life, they need you to be you. They don't need you to try to be somebody else. They need what you've got because what you've got is special. God created you specifically, and He created you specifically you. He puts you where you're at with the skills and, and, and the giftings, the three T's, the, the time, talent, and treasure that He gave to you. He puts you where you're at specifically on purpose so that you could affect the people around you. And again, I think sometimes we're always trying to move on to the next thing. We're always trying to get bigger, bigger and better, bigger and better. But again, don't despise small beginnings. Don't despise the truth that sometimes it takes time to build something. That's what I put on my Facebook the other day. I said, uh, if, if you want something different, do something different. Unless you're building something, in which case, keep up the good work. Because sometimes to, to stand firm, even when it feels like you're not moving, that's hard, man. But sometimes that's exactly what is needed. Because sometimes you only have a little bit of leaven, but you put it in the bread, and it leavens the whole deal. Because it spreads. When I very first started, years and years ago at this point, when I very first started this, this Word Without Walls ministry, I preached a message about being contagious. And I preached about how... Jesus wasn't afraid of catching what anybody else had. Because Jesus knew that the fire in him was always hotter than the fire he was in. He touched lepers. He didn't care. He wasn't worried about it. He wasn't afraid of catching leprosy. Because he knew if he touched a leper, they were going to catch his perfection. They were going to catch his holiness and his wholeness. Jesus wasn't afraid of other people being contagious because he knew what he had was the most contagious. And again, if we're looking at the kingdom through, through, through the dove's eyes, through, through the eyes of grace, then we're talking about love. Jesus knew love was more contagious than anything else in the world. I've always thought if God is all-powerful, that doesn't mean He has the most power. It means He has all of the power. And if God is love, that means love is all-powerful. Which again, doesn't mean love is the most powerful. It doesn't mean you have to use love to fight against things. It means that love is all-powerful, nothing else has any power, nothing else can stand in the face of love. Right? Don't overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Right? Don't fight. Just be who you are. Just, you know, I think again it was Abraham Lincoln who said, I destroy my enemies by making them my friends. And sometimes even that can seem small. Sometimes one-on-one -on -one relationships seem small, but they're not. Because if you affect one person, you may not change the whole world, but you may change one person's whole world. And then they may change the whole world, you don't know. Because if you've, again, if you've, uh, I don't want to say infected, because that doesn't necessarily have a, uh, a positive connotation, but if you touch somebody and you impart something, and then they take that, and then they touch other people, and then again, it just feeds on itself, and it spreads, and it spreads, and it grows, and it grows. And it may seem like you haven't done anything at all, but, but who knows? How that person that you affected will then go affect all the people in their life. So all of this made me think of the story in Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 49. And again, uh, when I read, every time I read this story, I always thought, you know, that's kind of a cute story. It, it, it kind of marks Jesus as not being like other people. And I remember when that movie, uh, Passion of the Christ, came out, and, and it showed, you know, Jesus as a boy, and it showed him running, and then it showed him, him falling. And people were like, oh, Jesus would never fall. And I was like, why wouldn't he fall if he was a kid running? My kid can't run three steps without sprawling out. Okay? And that's the point. Jesus was God in the flesh. He was loving about it. He came as we are. 
to experience His creation as we experience it. So I never had a problem with that at all. I had a problem with people who had a problem with that because it's like we want to put, we want to keep Jesus so safe and we want to keep him so far away and we want to say, well, he's way up there and we're way down here. When, when the truth of the matter is, is he came right down with us and brought us right up to where he is. He became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. So Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 41, in the King James it reads like this. Now his... Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, which apparently is, is the age of accountability, the age in the, in the Jewish uh, society where you're, you're considered to be a man, but 12 years old. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child, Jesus, tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, you, you know three days, right? Death, burial, resurrection, three days. It's all throughout all the scripture, and I think it's important here too. Because it's, that, it's, it's like that completion process. Where Jesus said, it is finished, and then three, day, three days later he rose again. Okay, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And this always struck me as, as very important. Verse 49, And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? A son, not in the sense of, of, of a natural father and son, but in the sense of spiritual sonship, a son is always about his father's business. Okay, and, and again, that's that deeper relationship that we begin to experience when the Holy Spirit leads and guides us into all truth by testifying of our true identity, by testifying of Jesus, who is our true identity. That's when we begin to, not necessarily to, to, to walk in God's footsteps, but really to let Him walk in our feet. Remember, Jesus said, I never do anything unless I see Daddy do it. And I never say anything unless I hear Daddy do it. So, why would he not be about his father's business? How would he not be about his father's business? But look what he was doing. At 12, to be about his father's business. He was sitting in church, learning, listening, answering, having discussions. He was simply just taking in the Word of God. He was receiving and releasing. That to him, at that age, that's what he could do. That's what he was capable of. And, and, and really, he was surprised that his parents were surprised. He's like, why, why would you think I would not be doing this? This is my small beginnings. Don't despise this. This is what I can do right now. This is where I can start. And look at it in the, uh, in the Message Bible. I'll just do verses uh, 49 and 50. He said, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? But they had no idea what he was talking about. So once again, Jesus, doing something that to him seems so completely natural, makes zero sense to everybody else. And sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I feel like people... I, I, I found this picture and, and I put it on my Facebook and, and nobody really responded to it at the time, which was kind of the point, because the picture said... People misunderstand me so much that they don't even understand their misunderstanding. Like it's like sometimes I feel like I'm so like I honestly I feel like this world doesn't make sense to me. And I see things that are like accepted and I see things that are taken for granted and I'm like why is that okay? How how is this where we just will just let people do this kind of stuff. And again, I'm not talking about fighting with people. I'm not talking about trying to make people fit into my box because I don't do that. But at the same time, I don't understand it. 
At the same time, I'm like, man, if you knew what I know, then you probably wouldn't have anything to do with that kind of stuff. You probably wouldn't be putting that stuff out there. You might be putting love out there. Because if you knew what I know, you would know that you are loved. And again, I like it when he, again in the Message Bible, he says, Why were you looking for me? Didn't you know that I had to be here dealing with the things of my father? Even at that young age, he knew that he had to start somewhere. And he wasn't, again, you know, he wasn't healing people. Jesus didn't heal anybody until after he was baptized and the Holy Spirit, like a dove, landed upon him and dwelt upon him. Okay? He wasn't out there preaching sermons. He was just doing what he could do. He was listening to the Word. He was understanding the Word. He was asking questions. He was answering questions. He was giving what he had. He was just doing what he could do with what he had where he was at. And, it, and, and, and as much as his parents didn't understand why he was doing that, he didn't understand why his parents didn't understand. He thought it was the most normal, natural thing in the world. Because again, as we saw in Zechariah 4.10, For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. He knew his daddy was happy with him. Remember again when he was baptized, what did God say? This is my son in whom this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus, I bet Jesus knew that his whole life. And I bet when God said that to him after the Holy Spirit descended, it was just confirmation. I don't think Jesus was ever seeking his father's approval. I think he was just doing what came natural to him. And what came natural to him was was to be in the house of God. Absorbing the Word of God. Absorbing it, or, or again, receiving it, so that He could release it. Because you can't give what you don't have. You have to receive it first. But you don't receive it just to have it. You receive it so you can release it. So you have something to give, so you have something to share. So again, when that seed is planted, so it can grow. And that's what the kingdom is. It's a seed that's planted. Jesus, the seed, is planted, and then He grows, and then we're His branches. We're connected to Him. We're connected to that source, and we bear the fruit. We have somewhere for the birds, or, or again, the dove, the Holy Spirit, to land and to dwell. And then once we have that understanding, once we have the Spirit of truth living inside of us, then we can know the truth, the truth can set us free, and then we can share the truth. Remember, we're epistles, right of all men. We're witnesses. You can't witness to something unless you experience it. So he has to first love us, and then we love each other. That's how the kingdom grows or expands. That's how we leaven that bread. We just put a little bit of love in, and a little bit of love goes a long, long way. I can tell you many times in my life, I've, I've, I've suffered silently, I've been discouraged, and then someone will give me a word. Just a little word of encouragement, and man, that fires me up big time. And then I'm like, you know what? This isn't all in vain. I am affecting people. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. I am just, again, I, I don't need to despise a small beginning. I can just do what I'm here to do with what I've got where I'm at. I don't have to try to be somebody else. I can just be me. I can just let Jesus be himself in me and through me and as me. So, again, I hope this is encouraging. You don't have to try to be a world beater or a history maker. All you're called to be is a son. And a son, just simply, just he's about his father's business. So, again, I hope this is encouraging. Like I said before, if you want something different, do something different, unless you're building something. If you're building something, stay with it. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged. So... That's what I have for this week. That's that's what I have for the Kingdom of Love. Thank you so much again for all your support, for your attendance, for uh, helping me share the word with the videos and the rants and the books and everything else. Uh, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Amen.